Fair warning, this is a long video with a lot of talking. So if you're not a pedal or gear nerd, or if you're not in the mood for that, this might be one that you just need to skip. But if you are into that, this guy, Tim, he'll introduce himself in just a second. He's very interesting. He's a wealth of knowledge and we learned a lot. And I had a good time discussing his, his pedal designs and learning about them. The other day we were out of town traveling and on a music store binge. And we had this list of music stores we were trying to hit. And as we went down through that list of music stores, we kept seeing these pedals that we had never heard of. We discovered that this guy is local, he has a music repair business, and that these were his original designs. So we were really interested in, in meeting him and talking to him, and we ended up showing up to a shop, and he was very friendly and a wealth of knowledge and very engaging. So he let us interview him and kind of get his history down and talk some of his circuits, and he explained some of them for us. So at the time of recording this video, we actually don't have the demos recorded and posted yet. Feel free to subscribe, you'll see the demos come up, or check the description below as soon as we get those posted we will put the links in the description below. Without further ado, here's Tim from Narwhal Industries and Full Custom Music Repair. Hi, I'm Tim from Full, owner and operator of Full Custom Music Repair and designer for Narwhal Industries. And I'm here in Lemoyne, Pennsylvania at my shop. Tim's got all kinds of crazy pedals that he's been working on. We played a couple of them. We love them, they're awesome. And so we wanted to come back and talk to him and get a little history. What got, what got you into this whole pedal game? What got you started? Well, I've, it's, as long as I've been in this business, I've also made amplifiers. I made my first amplifier when I was 17. And around the 2010 time period, when the economy was a little bit slower, uh, I decided I'd get into, into some pedals. Mm -hmm. And the first one was the Kraken. Okay. And I made that for a couple of years. And then uh, redesigned, and then we came up with uh, the Barnacle. This guy right here. We played that and it's super awesome. You've got an active EQ, bass and treble, mm -hmm. super powerful. It cleans up with the volume control, just like you know more of the traditional fuzzes would, but the, the active EQ for us, it really just pushed it into new territory and we were able to get some really heavy stuff out of it. You said it has seven transistors? Seven, seven, that includes the buffer. Okay. If the buffer is, you can switch it off if you don't want the buffer. Um, that's what the dip switches inside are for. And uh, if you just reverse the order of the dip switches, then it puts it into the buffer mode. Okay. So usually I have them in true by usually I have them in true bypass mode after they went through final QC, and then that's how I ship them. So we've seen a lot of fuzzes. There's a lot of parts. Yeah, yeah. There's, about, there's about 95 parts in that. So, um, you're not making the barnacle anymore? Is no, right? no, not right now. Um, due to um, the, the, the pandemic and some of the shortages that's going on and uh, not as many people working, people working from home, mm -hmm. uh, the controls that I used for the barnacle, they were custom-made controls, mm. and I cannot order them right now. Uh, it's, it's difficult to get custom order parts right now. Yeah. So, and that's... That affected the way, both the way that I made the pineapple and the way that I made the cardigan because the, they were both designed to use only off-the-shelf parts. Okay. So the only thing that, that is really custom uh, are the way the enclosures are drilled and the way that the, these, the main run of them were both drilled by the vendor that I bought the enclosures from. Okay. Talk to us about the cardigan. So you're making the cardigan now, right? Yes, yes. The cardigan is in current production, and the uh, the uh, blonde with wine knobs is the the current version that uh, we're making. Uh, last year's cardigan uh, was the this version here, which is uh, hammer tone copper. So this 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 one here is a. Uh, a bit more tweed voiced, and this one was uh, intended to be uh, a little bit more like a later blonde Fender. Okay. But yeah, really, I ended up just slight, only slightly changing it. I okay. may change it a little bit further uh, in the next production, change, just changing some of the values. Uh, although every barnacle that I made was absolutely as identical as I could. Mm -hmm. uh, cardigans, I tend to move them around a little bit and, okay. and they get to be a little bit different. That's cool. Um, so what we, what we experienced with it, we had it um, a Telecaster through a 6L6, actually a single-ended 
uh, 6L6 amp, which had a good sound. Um, it, it, it's aptly named because it, it felt like just a little bit of a warm sweater over the whole sound. <laughs> and we found it super usable, um, you know, the, through all the range of all the controls. And, um, you know, so this, give us a rundown of the controls. This is volume. That's correct. Tone and gain. Yes. Is that right? Yes. So we found it really nice to get just a little hair, you know, with something like this, and then an awesome clean boost, just better and more, but a little better. You know, it wasn't mm -hmm. totally clean. It was it was clean, but just a little bit better, a little bit warmer. We really liked that a lot. One of my favorite amps that I played the cardigan in front of uh, so far was a uh, Roland... Uh, Jazz Chorus 77. No way. Oh, yeah. That was that was a wonderful, wonderful sound. They're notorious for not taking pedals well. Yeah, and you know what? Um, one of the best uses for the cardigan is to kind of use it as a kind of firewall. Uh, if you've got something that doesn't take pedals well, this should. The front end of it should take pedals just like an amp. Yeah. And you could put this in front of an amp that doesn't take pedals well. So at the and end then, of your, you would go yeah, at the end of your signal chain. And then put chain. your pedals in front of that, or possibly in the middle of your pedal board where you could put uh, other drives in front of it and then put delays behind it. Yeah. Because the cardigan will take the brunt, it'll make the compression that needs to happen, yeah. and then you can have those other pedals afterwards. It, I commented Jeremy when he was playing it, it sounds like a produced guitar tone. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like an album produced kind of studio sound. It just gave it that little bit of something special. And you talked about it being a buffer and taking pedals well. And I guess we should probably talk about what's inside. Yes. So it's not the first pedal that I've seen with the 12AX7 in it. But I think, at least for myself, it's the first one that I've heard that I said, that's not a gimmick. That's actually doing something. Because a lot of them, to me, seem like they put a tube in there because people want to see a tube. Um, the tube doesn't do a whole lot. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you talked to me the other day about the DC to DC converter you built, some of the special sauce that you've got going in there. Don't reveal any trade secrets, <laughs> yeah. but talk to us yeah. a little bit about some of the magic you have in there. Well, the, you, can, you can use a regular 9 or 12 volt supply on this. Uh, so that makes it much more pedal board friendly than a lot of other pedals with the tube. There's no special supply needed. The only real requirement is it has enough available current. Mm -hmm. uh, ideally, you, ideally, you want an isolated tap from... What are you supply. looking for on a current? 500 milliamps, 450, what are... Three to 400 okay. is usually sufficient. Okay. Uh, when I was designing that, that converter in this pedal, uh, uh, Voodoo Lab, the yeah, power yeah. supply, yep. they have a higher current 9 volt out yep. and, and, and a higher current 12. Yeah. should work perfect with that. Okay. Um, there's a lot of pedal board power supplies that this should work fine with. Yeah. Um, so the DC converter takes the incoming, the incoming voltage and it, it brings it from 9 or 12 up to 100, which just gets you on the data sheet of the original Sylvania. Yeah. Because all the charts on that, they start at 90, and that, that's what's recommended as the minimum voltage. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're there. It's real because we can use real part values. Yeah. Well, so it was interesting. You, when we talked yesterday, you said about it being 100 volts, and... You know, I'm not a I'm not an electronics guy, but I was thinking, boy, I, I thought the voltages were a lot higher. And we got to looking, and if you look back at the old tweeds, a lot of those, or the first, you know, V1 is going to be 100, 110 volts. So you're in that you're in that territory, and it, so it made sense um, that it was getting that kind of tweed warmth and um, a lot all of that the early tweeds it. and a lot of amps from that time period. The first stage was grid leak bias. And they, they usually only have 90 volts or, or 100 or so no on there for that stage. Uh, later, slightly later on, when you get into mid-50s, they start to get away from those grid leak by stages, but the plate voltage didn't really start to rise until the later 50s. Okay. Now, that's interesting. So, running a lower voltage is going to give you more more sag, more compression? Is that kind of how that works? The lower or? the plate voltage is, the, the less gain it takes to make that stage break up. Okay. So... Uh, you you'll you'll get to that spot a little quicker. Yeah. So it, it's with that plate voltage that low, it's it's pretty much ideal for another pedal to break up that first stage, and it doesn't make clipping too difficult in in the second stage. Because I'm yeah. limited. A twelve X seven only has two stages, so I'm limited to the amount of gain I can have. Yeah. 
So it's a 12AX7 in there, or are you using a Y, or? You can use any of those. Any of them, any yeah, of the 12A. Yeah, yeah. I specifically wanted this pedal to be able to use any of those tubes. Okay, so if I went from a 12AX7 to a 12AY7, the 12AY7 is going to be in the same way in this pedal that it would in an amp, where it's going to be a little bit cooler, is that? Yeah, that what, what I found in these specifically, two things happen when you go to a 12AY in these. Uh, they, they get a little bit more high end and okay. they have a little bit less gain. Okay. And we found like the, the entire range was completely usable and completely musical and not in, I mean, I wouldn't call it an overdrive at extreme settings unless the amp was set on the edge of breakup, which I think it would probably do a really good job of an edge of breakup amp just giving it that extra kick. Um, yeah, we found it just super usable across the entire range and um, you know it looks like it built really really well and great components in there so we enjoyed that one a lot what um what kind of tone circuit are you using in this pedal is it like like a fender or is it more like a Baxendahl or is it more just like in, a... In this one here, yeah. um, the, the first one, if you find ones that are brown that aren't hammer tone copper, that were the first run of them, they were really close to what was in the, um, the, the late Tweed Deluxe. Okay. So in the, in the 59. Mm -hmm. uh, these ones actually, uh, when I went to this and, and this, this one too, I was really looking at a lot of Tweed Princeton's because there was an awful lot of interesting circuits in the Tweed mm -hmm. Princeton time. And there was one specifically that was a little bit different than all the other ones. And this is somewhat similar to that, that Tweed Princeton. Awesome. Um, are you still making the pineapple? Or the is that one that people might still find available it's still available i still have some in stock there'll be some more going to some uh, some dealers but it's not currently in production okay so i it's it's difficult to produce more than one product at a time yeah on this small scale uh i will probably bring the pineapple back if people want it and the, and, and it's sold again yeah in in some form um if not i'll design another pedal to replace it okay um when the cardigans are done, I will probably go to something else in this enclosure, and then we'll probably bring the starfish back at the same time. Okay, and the starfish was a scrambler. That was a scrambler, cool. yeah. And this is a uh, fuzz? Yes. It, uh, volume and fuzz to control? No, no, or, no, gate and volume. Gate and volume, okay. Yes, yes. So your, your gate is going to give you the spittiness? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everything above... Uh, above uh, Oh, notice I'm looking at it from the other direction. Everything below uh, 12 o'clock is gated. Everything above is uh, ungated. Uh, a lot of uh, right here in between that setting there, you get octave down. Right there, you get even clipping. And here you start to get octave up until it gets really smooth. That's awesome. So at, at that setting, the clipping is as even as it is in the barnacle. Because the barnacle has like really perfectly even clipping. Yeah, yeah. So with the cardigan, you're talking about a pedal that's got some amp inspiration. I think they all kind of have some amp in inspiration. Because, More so than yeah. pedal inspiration. So yeah, like this yeah. isn't a fuzz face. That's not a muff. It's no. your design. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. So talk to us a little bit about like you have an interesting business model. Most people would be online store slinging as many pedals as they could get i looked at your website and it said go to a dealer come and see me what's the can you talk to us a little bit about your just philosophy and why you do things the way that you do oh uh, the internet market is very crowded right now uh early adopters into the internet market could get in pretty er uh, could get in well and, and sell and establish themselves but a new player especially if you're not making clones of anything it's really really hard to mm -hmm. sell um, people tend to have something in mind when they shop online. They tend to have a different opinion of what they of what they're looking for when they go to a store. Yeah. So yeah. when people go to a store, they're typically looking for an experience or to or to look for something new or they haven't seen. When they shop online, they're looking for a specific item. Yeah. So I think you're 100 percent right because. You know, we we're on a we're on a trip for work, and so we wanted to stop at every music store that we could. 
all the ones that only sold new or the established brands that we knew, it's like, well, we have that on Musician's Friend. Yeah. We don't need to look. And then we go into the little bit funkier stores and we hey, what's this narwhal? What's a cardigan? What's a, what's a barnacle? And, you know, so we started hearing word of mouth on our way here. There's this guy that builds these pedals. And then we come talk to you. And so I think you, you've absolutely nailed how we found you. Um, I think it's, you know, you're, it's harder to find, but I think it's more rewarding, you know, for, for people that are interested in, you know, knowing where their things come from and knowing that they're built by a person and, and original designs and things like that. So I think you're onto something there. And, and also I've done a lot of business to business work in my career. So I know yeah. how to establish those contacts. So you've got a dealer network that people could find if they want to seek out your stuff through. Yeah. Through a yeah I, I, I like to list my dealers on the store. I have one more dealer that I have the list on the website that I, I'll have to, I'll have to put it awesome. on the site then later on today. So you, you said um, something about, you know, the early adopters to the internet, you know, had an easier time getting in, but you're not a newcomer. You've been, do you've been doing this for quite a while. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah, since, since 97. Wow. It's what, how long I've been in this business. And so we'll take a little tour through the shop, but you've got every vintage, every make, every model of amp that you could imagine that you do a lot of amp repairs, that kind of bread and butter in between That's this. the main business. Yeah. Um, I've worked on just about everything. If, if you name it, I've probably had my hands in it. I've probably had it apart, you know. Um, any shop is going to work on a lot of Fender stuff because yeah. Fender outsells the market. Yeah. Just they outproduce, they outsell. Yeah. And they, they, they have probably the deepest history of any manufacturer. Sure. There's so much in the market you can get. I'm hoping to eventually get back into, into building custom amplifiers. Yeah. But, but this has been so much fun for me that yeah. I've kind of stayed here. I'm definitely going to design at least one more new product this year, and then uh, next year uh, after that, we we may expand to something else that's similar to the cardigan, but a, a little a little bit different. Do you feel like you're sentimental with your designs, or do you feel like everything's always a work in progress? And you know, the reason I ask if I if I like the sound of this cardigan, is mm -hmm. there a guarantee that you're going to keep making this, or are you kind of always evolving as your own taste and your own ideas keep going? Mm. The cardigan has been slowly evolving because there's an awful lot of compromises with putting this circuit in this small of an enclosure, mm -hmm. and I had to learn a lot to do this. Um, Something like that, like like the 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 pineapple. I'm probably not going to change the pineapple at any point. If I would change it, uh, I would probably just call it a different thing. Or yeah, the pineapple yeah. too. The, yeah. the the barnacle, because the, I, I I'm not going to ever change the barnacle. Yeah. If it's if I can't make the barnacle the way the, the way I originally made it, I'm just not going to make it again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because it was. When when I was working on this design and I had this thing breadboarded, uh, one one of the other guys that worked with me at that time period, yeah, uh, he was in the other room working on something, and I got to a certain point and and he he came over, stopped what he was doing, came over and said, "Whatever you're doing, stop there. It's Don't done. do another <laughs> thing to it. It's done." That's awesome. And and that's the, that's where I finished the barnacle. This, what. You know that wasn't the entire circuit. That was only that was only a front half of it. What was interesting about making this pedal and this design is because of how many parts it, it are on it. I couldn't I couldn't prototype the whole thing. Yeah. I could prototype the front half of it. I could prototype the back half of it, mm. and I could prototype the buffer. But it wasn't until I had the board designed in CAD and had ordered those boards and got them that I could actually build and play a whole barnacle there's some limited and one-off stuff i did too that i don't know if i'd remember everything i made i tried to list a bunch of them and tried to make a whole list of them and everyone i remembered um i didn't keep really good records when i when i first started building yeah uh pedals and it was only about three or four years after um like about halfway through the production of these, I actually started keeping a list of serial numbers. Yeah. Because all the serial, one thing we didn't talk about that we talked about off camera was all the serial numbers are date encoded. Oh, right. So right. Every, every serial number that you've got there, if you look at it, it they all the letters mean something. So if you find one of my pedals and you look there, like, so this is Barnacle Fuzz. It was made 32nd week of 2019, and it was number... 
142 in the series. So, and there's only a couple of times I've actually reset that number. And I think total that I can, that, that I could track down and remember there's about 400 pedals I've built so far. Wow. So, and I built a ton last year. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because we had just last, well, we'll run down what, we, what, what yeah. was made, what was made last year. So, we had cardigans, pineapples, starfish, Mr. Toad, which is nothing more than pineapple and starfish in one box. Yeah. Uh, it's a picture of that on the website. Yeah, we, we found one of those to play yeah. in, in a store, too, and that thing was pretty wild. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a dozen of them. There's no, wrong no way to make, there's no wrong way to play Mr. Toad as long as you make it croak. <laughs> like, that's, that, that's the way. It had a lot of rivet. Yeah. It did. Yeah. And... And yeah, that's 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 pretty much what I made that year. Well, see, the nice thing about a lot of your pedals is they're pretty. It's pretty obvious what they're called because we didn't know that the Mister Toad was a Mister Toad. And Jeremy said, "What's the Toad?" And they said, "That's a Mister Toad." Yes. Yes. <laughs> I was like, oh, yes. oh, yes. Mister. Okay. Yes. Yes. It, and 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 I, I if I make another version of Mister Toad, which it, it's I still have that Toad stamp. Yeah. Uh, my my helper who helped me build the pineapple. Uh, and who helps out around the shop about once a week when he's not on tour. Uh, he has designated the next toad pedal must be Senor Toad. Oh, nice. Yeah. So Let's give it a little, little south of the border flavor. Yeah, it's got to be Senor Toad. Well, Starfish Scrambler, I mean, okay, if we go back to the history of the, uh, where, where the Starfish Scrambler came from, because there was another pedal that came before the Starfish, uh, and that was uh, Dr. Prawn. Oh, yeah. I got a... <laughs> I got a I got a pretty good laugh out of that one too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. I only made, I only made two Doctor Prawn pedals. Uh, I think I had four boards for it, so I had two yeah. more boards back. That was a CMOS ring modulator, and that pedal was really weird, because um, it had, it had two, it had two frequency adjustments: fine and coarse. Okay. And then blend and then overall volume. And you could, and I had modified one to have an expression pedal for the, for oh, the cool. suite. And it was, cool. it was basically my attempt at building a, a, a small format guitar synth. Yeah. And yeah. It, it, it didn't quite meet what I needed. And it was really weird and people didn't understand it at yeah. all. But the there, there, there's pedals. two guys, yeah, there's two guys <laughs> that have that pedal and it, it's, it's bizarre. Cool. So I was like, ah, I need something a little bit more accessible than yeah, this. Yeah. I need so this is a, li a little bit too far out. Okay. So I came up with the Starfish Scrambler for that. Okay. And that was that was I took some of the things I learned from making a CMOS ring modulator and then used some uh, germanium diodes in order to make a completely different circuit that was yeah. a little bit more accessible. How do you feel about you know a lot of a lot of pedal builders are using you know, magic diodes and unobtainium transistors. Um, I, I've i played some of those, and sometimes I think there's something to it. Sometimes I think it's cork sniffing. How do you feel about that? Like, are there are there component values that are, that are very important to you that you feel like are very different? Or do you think that a lot of that cork sniffing on the component level is, is nonsense? So I work on things from every time period of electronics, uh, the whole way back to the 1930s to stuff that's brand new. Mm -hmm. So at any point, I could be doing anything here. I could be, you know, anything from making sure that a DA converter works properly in a line six mm -hmm. to restoring a 1930s uh, amplifier that's yeah. pre World War II, and. The more you understand about electronics, the more you realize that there are many things that you can just design around. Okay. So, or you can design something to be in the, in there. Um, what certain components do is not necessarily impossible with different components entirely. And like I said, with these two pedals, I initially intended to use the same controls as the barnacle. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't get that right now. And even the controls that I initially wanted for the original cardigan design, I couldn't get. So 
I had to change these designs to use what was available. And that, that's, that's, I, I feel they sound just as good as they would if I'd used different components. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't think they would have sounded any different or any, any better or worse. And in fact, I can even compare that because I have another one down here that, that, that is using closer to the parts that, that, that I wanted. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, because some, you know, some, well, we just saw, um, I don't know if you saw Boss had the, the solo sound collab with that fuzz and it was like, well, we could only build 100 because that's all the diodes we had. And, you know, supposedly there's something very, very special about that batch and the tolerances matter that much. But it sounds like, you're starting with you're starting with what you want and you're designing until you get it rather than starting with a handful of parts that are unobtainium and super rare and just saying well that is what it is is that i mean fair? i mean i had an unobtain unobtainium pedal that i put together when i was prototyping the barnacle mm -hmm. and it was i had an i had an enclosure for a vintage fuzz face Mm -hmm. And I had a bunch of uh, Mullard germanium transistors, vintage Mullard stamped germaniums. And I restored that fuzz face using those. Yeah. And this thing could just nail that. Really? You could dial in that exact tone with this pedal. Interesting. E e exactly. Interesting. And then you could make this thing sound like another one. So that fuzz face will only ever get that, that one sound. Yeah. This thing can do that and more things. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, but this has a lot more circuit complexity. If you look at the number of parts in a fuzz phase, I guess every part only, really matters when you only have ten. Every part really matters. <laughs> yeah. You have to use this exact transistor. You have to use this exact resistor and this capacitor. And if you use different parts in that pedal, it will sound different. Yeah. Because in the context of that design, that's what sounds like that. So you need the unobtainium when a design is very, very simple. But the greater you, you scale up the complexity of your design, the more flexibility you have to change your design, and the 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 more you can design around certain parts. Oh, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And sort of along those lines, and just thinking of the way that you approach circuits, it seems like um, you know if I was going to start trying to build pedals, I would start from pedals. It seems like you started from amps, and your amp knowledge. Mm -hmm. And how to do those things in a pedal form factor is that is that a fair? Yeah, it's coming. It's I like when I when I played in bands a lot in the in the nineties and early two thousands. I hardly used any pedals. It yeah. was it was my sixty nine Bassman and my Dunlop Wah yeah. and a Digitech Delay and my SG and that was my entire rig. Yeah. So, I my whole tone was basically focused on that limited amount of gear and that basement. And if I didn't yeah. like my tone, I brought my basement to work with me and I changed it. And <laughs> that basement got cut up and yeah. uh, many, many, many times to the point where it was no longer a basement head. It was a single channel combo with a 12 inch speaker and a modified hot rod JMP style preamp and a Fender preamp in the other side and EL 34s. I think cool. at one point I had one sixty five fifty and one EL 34 in it because I just <laughs> wanted to see what that sounded like. Yeah. You know, that amp got abused. Have you ever made, have you ever worked on a pedal design, something in your head, worked on it, worked on it, and finally just said, it's trash. I, I, I can't get it, or I'm not, I'm not happy with it, I'm done. Just trash the whole design? Yeah. No. You just keep working until you get it. No, yeah, I mean, a, lo a lot of the stuff... Well, I mean... Yeah, I mean, just... just the, this is what I probably worked the hardest on, because th this was this was a big challenge. This yeah. was a huge... In fact, I, I the first... D, the, this, the DC converter went through two completely different designs. I, the, yeah. the first design was completely abandoned, and I, des I went completely ground up and, de and designed a completely different converter. But most of the work in this design is in the converter, not the audio circuit. And, you know, I think, I think this design, for the, the cork sniff and tone guys, which sometimes we can be, um, it has its own thing. And it's very subtle, but if you're in that, trying to find just the right thing, and you're you know, debating between silver, gold, clon, and, you know, if you're into that realm, I think this is something that you would really appreciate, because it has a lot of complexity, but subtlety, and there's, it's, you know, if you're into that, if you're into that mode, yeah, I think it's super I mean, usable. Where's, where's it? I have my personal cardigan, which was the first cardigan. 
That's cool. And I have a piece of unobtainium in that. I've got a Raytheon uh, 12AY7 that someone gave me. Yeah. And, and I just really like the sound of that tube and that pedal. How do you, how have you found, I don't know if you, have you toured with it or do you know anybody that's toured with it? How does the tube hold up in that socket, in that, like if I have this on a pedal board and I'm roading it, do I need to take some care with that? It should be fine. I mean, I use a really good gold pin ceramic socket in there. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I haven't had anybody problems with these overheating or anything because I mean, the case is aluminum. Mm -hmm. Aluminum disperses heat pretty well. The ceramic socket is, I chose that because of that. And these, these, these are really tight. Yeah. So haven't had any problems yet. If someone has a problem, I'll let people know and change the design accordingly. But so far it's been pretty good. Oh, there it is. Like I said, sometimes junk around here isn't junk. It seems like you can't really patent or like protect amp designs because so many of them went back to some old RCA manual or wasn't there like an old tube manual that had the circuit no, we in? We have the old tube manual. You got the old I tube mean, manual. I mean, I've got the old tube manual. If you look here in the original RCA receiving tube manual and we, we, we look at things. Because they wanted to make tubes and they wanted to give people something to use tubes for. Well, whoa, whoa, this is, this is, no, we're going to talk about the way that this, the way that electronics industry just in general works. I mean, we, we've got RCA makes tubes and then they would have example circuits in their manual. Yeah. And. And then engineers would use those example circuits to make their own designs. That's still done today. If you look at all of the powered speakers or most of the powered speakers and, and many of the class D amplifiers that, that, that are, uh, around, there is a manufacturer that makes a pulse width modulator chip that mm -hmm. will drive a pair of MOSFETs and make you a wonderful little power amplifier of whatever size you want. And mo a lot, a lot of those amplifiers are made right from that application data sheet. Interesting. So, yeah, you can't really sue somebody else from a circuit that you didn't invent. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's not, even if you kind of tweak it a little bit, it's still, it, it, if it originally went back to someone else's intellectual property, then... Yeah. Your source material was a yeah. sample circuit. Yeah. At the end and, of the day. And most products have some sort of source material. Even even my circuit circuits that are my orig original circuits, they there's some source material that I used. Yeah. Yeah. You know, whether I completely modified the, the circuit entirely, like the barnacle uses a lot of bootstrap preamps. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, it, it uses a Baxadol tone stack, it's active version, yeah. and it's a bootstrap. I didn't invent any of those. Is it, is it my circuit? Well, yeah, because there's not another barnacle and there's nobody, nobody put those ingredients together in the same way. Yeah. But just like, just like baking a cake, I didn't invent eggs, yeah. you know? <laughs> I didn't invent flour. Just found you know, a better they, way to mix them up. Yeah. And you were talking about, um, when we were here the other day, something that's been keeping you busy lately has nothing to do with any of this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I have a little bit of side work doing some um, um, uh, air conditioning control modules for commuter rail. And it, it, a, lo a lot of those stuff was designed in the 70s and 80s, and those, those trains are old, but they need to keep running. And they, they have air conditioners and people want to stay cool. Yeah. So it's, it's a nice way to make money and then put that money into new designs. And that was, uh, that was what my shop teacher, that was, that was his, what he would say. Big brown, big brown rabbits yield great big vocal groans when gingerly slept. <laughs> <laughs> I bit off a little more than I wanted with an old uh, Rhodes. Oh yeah, and uh, I mean, there's not many. There's not much electronic in there. You know, it's you got your pickups on every time, um, but most of it's just mechanical tweakery. You know, just and then you get it, you get it all tuned up, and you put it back in the case, and that's enough to get it out of tune. And then you lift it back up, and you're pounding on it. And also in my library, the original road parts and service manual. <laughs> <laughs> this this place has been here since 1979. So yeah, it's littered with history. Are there any of your pedals for bass players that they ought to be looking into? Um, Starfish, I actually was originally kind of a bass pedal. Okay. But it works either for bass or guitar. 
a lot of my pedals work really good for bass because I play either bass or guitar. I okay. play them interchangeably. Yeah. Um, Barnacle. Oh, man. Barnacle is amazing on bass. We'll have to try it that way. Yeah, be... you got to try Barnacle with bass. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the point where I say something really bass that makes the entire video Just not worth it. the whole thing. <laughs> like us, sorry we came. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna edit that out. That dude's really weird. Stop it there. If you want to know more about Narwhal Industries or full custom music repair, we'll put his links down in the description below. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video and um, stick around. Look for the links down there for the demos of some of these pedals that we have as well.